Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My name is Helen Joan Morley. Mm -hmm. I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I was at the English Language Institute from 1957 to 2004. I, it may not be the record, but it's a pretty good record. <laughs> what was your role? Yeah. And uh, so many good directors. Uh, one of my favorites, of course, was Diane Larson Freeman, who was one of my students originally, and um, I was invited to her wedding, a beautiful wedding, beautiful husband. And uh, I think perhaps my favorite director that had the most influence on me was John Swales. We hired him, uh, he was British, and uh, he came and uh, we met with him, thinking about hiring him, and everybody was impressed with him. And he brought a whole new dimension to us. New ways of thinking, new ways of looking at problems, new ways of teaching, and so on. He was super, super. Two very, very good directors. And from what I hear, the current director is doing a very nice job. Very nice job, and we're very pleased to have that. The first program I took here, um, I had been teaching up in Washington State. I was a public school speech therapist <clears throat> and traveled around yeah, having different schools during the week. And then I came back here to go to graduate school. And the first thing I took before I actually enrolled in the graduate school was a program called the TEP, Teacher Education Program which was sponsored by the U.S. government. And it was teachers, I think 35 or 40, from all over the world. And I had to go home and get out my atlas of the world to even find out where some of these countries were, but it was a wonderful experience. There were only three Americans. There were um, two people who were returning Peace Corps people, and me. And the others were from, I, I would suppose, 30 different countries or so. And that said to me, I think that's the profession I want to go into. Hearing them talk, uh, seeing what they were doing in their countries, problems that they had, uh, kinds of work, uh, textbooks and so on they would like to see, and so on. So it was just a fine, fine experience. Mm -hmm. The old TEP. Well, I guess I told <clears throat> yesterday uh, a little story about Diane. <laughs> I had come around the corner of the building there and here was this young woman standing in the middle of the hall with some papers in her hand and looking at me and she looked up and she said, you're Joan Morley. And I said, yes, a little warily. I didn't know what I was about. And she said, oh, thank goodness, I need to ask you some questions. <laughs> so that was one of my favorites, I think. <laughs> Doug Brown was a fine uh, director and, and enjoyed. He was very, very open. You could come into his office, you didn't even have to make an appointment all the time. You just tap on the door and if he wasn't busy, well, usually his door wasn't even closed. He was just very welcoming, uh, as was John Swales. Mm -hmm. At first we, we didn't know who was this rather dignified looking Brit, and we weren't just quite sure how we were supposed to approach him, but we soon found he was very approachable. And always he had the greatest wit. Uh, some of it was, was kind of British wit, and we had to think twice, but he, he was a wonderful, witty person. Mm -hmm. I have stayed close to Sue Gass, wonderful teacher, wonderful person. She and her husband, Josh Ard. Uh, Carolyn Madden has always been a good friend. Uh, Judy Dyer, who was one of my students, and I, as I was telling someone, I guess, um, I was there at a baptism of her baby. She was, um, I'm Episcopalian, she was Episcopalian, and I was invited to that, which was very, very special. When I was teaching up in Washington State, I was there for four years, and I worked with children as young as three, uh, children who had severe disabilities, such as cerebral palsy and things like that. I would go into their homes, and I would help their parents, uh, teach them how to do things to, to help the little child. And then uh, I also had K through 12, and then I had adult classes in the morning sometimes. Uh, they would be engineers, healthcare workers, um, and people like that who wanted to be able to improve their English so they could publish in English and so they could give papers, conference papers. And so um, with the, this kind of a background, um, I decided I wanted to do a book on listening because of the skills, reading, writing, speaking, and listening, 
Listening was the one no one paid attention to. Lots and lots of books on grammar and reading books, writing texts, speaking, pronunciation, but nothing, nothing except in French uh, was their textbooks on listening. So I went over to the French department and I sat in on some courses of Helene Du and saw some of the things that they were doing and so on. And then I thought, I'm going to do a book on listening. So I had a friend uh, in my office and she was a writing person and Mary Lawrence. And she decided she wanted to do a book too. So we went down to see the director and uh, it was, his name was Ronald Wardoff. And um, we told him what we wanted to do and you know that we would appreciate having a class released so we didn't have to teach so many classes. So we went away and he called us back in a few days and he said, okay, you're on it. And he said, he was a very precise person, he said, but I want those manuscripts on my desk by XX date. So Mary and I went back to our office and we looked at each other and said, what have we gotten ourselves into? <laughs> but it was a good experience. And I did find that um, doing a few lessons for class was totally different from a book. Uh, so I have to thank my very tolerant students because I had to try out lesson after lesson with them and came out with what I think was, it was called a landmark book because there was no book like it before on listening. It was called Improving Oral Comprehension. And uh, it sold very, very well. At one time, I made more money off my royalties than I did off salary, which may say something about salaries, I don't know, but <laughs> anyway. Um, then I followed up that with a book called uh, Listening Dictation, which was a combination of grammar and listening. And it was um, listening and writing things and then listening and choosing uh, multiple choice and so on. And it was a little book that surprisingly sold uh, over 50,000 copies also. I, I had never thought it was, would be that, that what, popular, but it was pretty popular. And then I did one called Improving Spoken English which was on pronunciation. And uh, for that, I did tapes uh, in the English Language, uh, the uh, Language Resource Center. Uh, I went over there and taped all of the lessons. So that's my voice on there. And I was telling yesterday, one of the things I did with all of my books, instead of writing a teacher book, I would write, perhaps in a footnote, or perhaps right in the lesson, I would say, your teacher may want you to do blah, 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 blah. I didn't say the teacher had to do it, so the students couldn't complain, you know, you're where you're supposed to do this, but it was a choice. And I made suggestions of things I thought that the teacher might want to do, and got around having then. I already had to have an answer book because it was the kind of book that had fill-ins all the time and questions, so there was an answer book, and I didn't want there to have to be a teacher's book also, so I wrote the teacher's book into the, into the books. I think, I can't, I can't think of anything else that I would want to do with my life. It's a career, it, it, it came to be a career that was just wonderful. I liked especially working with people from all over the world and visiting people. I worked for the U.S. State Department Bureau of Language and Culture at one time, and they would send me to different countries to evaluate programs and set up programs. English is a very good ambassadorial kind of thing in a country, to have people there who are teaching and then uh, have students who are learning English. It's very good press. <laughs> but um, as I went to these different countries, saw people in their corner of the world, their culture, their language, I really began to see that people inside are all the same. We are human beings, we share qualities, no matter what the dressing on the outside looks like, we are all there. Mm -hmm. And I have a quotation from um, John F. Kennedy, and it's on the front of, the, of a book that I brought, and I don't see it right in front of me, but he says, um, we can all make a difference, and we should try. And that's kind of been my motto. Um, we language teachers, English language teachers, change the lives of our students for the better, I think. We give them a gift. 
we give them a gift of learning a language that will serve them. A lingua franca, perhaps. It's not that English is the best language in the world, the most beautiful language in the world. We know that's French. But um, it's the most serviceable because it's a lingua franca. If a, a Japanese man uh, in the car business <clears throat> goes to Mexico to buy steel, they can't talk in one another's language, but they use the lingua franca of English. And I think that's one of the extra special things about English and about being a teacher of English. Yes? Mm -hmm.